Thanks, Bridget. I want to say thanks to the organizers for inviting me once again. Uh, I, this is my second time for uh, Go To Chicago. Uh, I've been to Chicago loads, but normally I get to come in the winter. Uh, and I actually quite like the winters here because they're like a proper winter. You're not messing about. That's like a proper, full-on winter experience you get. Uh, last year, the weather was amazing. So I was packing for this trip, and I asked Alexa what the weather was like in Chicago. And Alexa goes, there will be a flood alert. It was a bit of a delay, right, because uh, Alexa had to take all of my personal information and send it to the NSA. But then once it finished with that, it was all like, there is a flood alert from Monday to Thursday. And I'm like, oh, that's good. The only four days I'm in Chicago, flood alert. But uh, the weather has cleared up, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. Yes, this won't be a talk about microservices. Um, obviously, I'll plug my book, because I'm not stupid. Uh, we are going to be talking about different subjects instead. I used to actually work for a Chicago headquartered company, ThoughtWorks, for many, many years. And there's a bunch of my old ThoughtWorks friends knocking around. I then moved on to work for a company called Atomist. Uh, and then I left them to become uh, independent when I left uh, uh, Australia last year, early this year. And so now I run my own company, which is really focus on what I think is the most important and uh, crucial aspect of IT in the 21st century, which is namely myself. Uh, so, a um, uh, little, little tip, I am the only person in the company right now. It, my accountant made me do this. He said I appear more formal. Uh, so far, it seems to be working out. I use the word we a lot when really it's I. You know all these things are about, like, okay? Uh, now, interesting, although I'm not here to talk about microservices, I, I kind of did want to reflect a little bit on why I even got interested in microservices in the first place. It was because I've, from my early days in ThoughtWorks, my main focus area was actually on helping people ship software more quickly. And so I spent lots of times looking at continuous integration, continuous delivery, cloud automation, infrastructure automation, automated testing, and all of those sorts of things. And realized that actually, uh, a lot of the time it was the architecture of the systems themselves that made it hard to ship software more quickly. And so in many ways, this talk is me just going back to my roots and really re-examining a lot of those original principles that we were focusing on in the, in the early days of, of, continu of the continuous delivery movement and, and seeing if they still apply in this sort of new um, post-GitHub, but hopefully not entirely post-factual world. I may even reference some data. So let's see how that gets on. But I do want to take you back to the early days of my ThoughtWorks career in 2004. Uh, I joined ThoughtWorks, um, and they immediately dispatched me off to go and work for a client. That client was a company called Dixon's. If you've ever been to the UK and a UK airport, you would have seen a Dixon's Travel Emporium, where you can buy electrical equipment for a mere five pounds less than it would pay, cost you in the high street, but then you've got to work out how you're going to take a huge like ghetto blast on a plane with you. Uh, and the project we were working on was to uh, create an electronic component cell system, actually a custom, fit, fit almost full chain electronic component cell system, a really, really big, big project. And so I was told to go to the platform at Houston Station, and just they said, you're getting on a train, and you're going to Hemel Hempstead, and there will be other people on the platform, and I'm sure you can work out who they are. Uh, and it sort of said a lot for the diversity of the company in the UK at that time. When I got on the platform, I could tell exactly who my co-workers are. And so we had many happy hours traveling up and down that train on, up to Hemel Hempstead and back. Uh, actually, our, our topic of conversation most journeys was, should we actually get off at Hemel Hempstead or stay on the line for a bit longer? Because uh, we were got on at Euston, and the line went all the way up to, uh, to Hemel Hempstead, which was it's just an OK place. But if you stayed on a few more stops, you could go to Bletchley Park. Um, we did go off the train most of the times, but every now and then it was a bit hard going to work, and that was because I joined at a rather interesting moment on the project. Um, you see, the project had been going for a while, but initially had been a, uh, a project where we came on board. They had been quite behind schedule, and it was a real push to get things out. A few years had rolled on, and the team were currently working on um, the third release of the software. I say release, each sort of release went out to multiple, had multiple actual deployments. But it was like a bucket of, this is the R3 focus of work. And each release had taken in an, a, a larger section of the whole Dixon's uh, sort of organizational emporium. They had like loads of different brands on the high street. 
And so, you know, uh, and, and I came in just after a moment when uh, something kind of interesting had happened. So the, the bulk of the, of the uh, development organization had been working on the R3 band of branch of code, checking in lots and lots of changes, but there'd been this awareness that there'd been a lot of, sort of te what you now call technical debt building up. And there was a bunch of people that wanted to make some fairly substantial changes to the code base. And so the decision was made, well, look, these changes are going to be quite impactful, and it's going to be quite hard for us to do that while still delivering features. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do a not uncommon thing at that time, but effectively um, sort of cut off a, a part of our team and have them focus on making these sort of larger scale architectural changes. So off we did, we forked off the R4 branch, uh, and uh, that team, while the R3 team were busy actually, you know, delivering real value to customers, the rest of the ivory tower architects um, decamped to a different office to work on their changes. Oh, yeah, we, and there was actually, to be fair, there was a lot of really good stuff was being done. Uh, after projects matured for a while, you get a, you get a sense of a better way of doing things, and this was all about actually trying to consolidate things down. And after a while, the R4 team felt, okay, we've got a pretty good grasp of what's going on now, and we think actually this is now a version of code we want to send live, and so now we need to make the R4 branch our live production release of software. But of course, while we've been chipping our stuff, we've been, well, we've been working on refactoring our repository layers and coming up with new web handlers or whatever it is they were doing at the time. It was actually a swing application, so actually even not quite web. Uh, but we've got to bring in all that change that's been happening in the R3 branch since we merged. And so that'll be easy, right? We'll just sort of merge in many, many months worth of development work being done by, by you know, tens if not hundreds of developers. And that's going to be absolutely fine, right? <laughs> Turns out, not so much. And I arrived just as this process had happened. Uh, and I, you know, some of the people I joined with on the same day were dispatched off to various parts of the organization. And then they say, came to me and said, so, we've got a very exciting proposition for you. How would you like to join the R3, R4 merge bug fix team? <laughs> to which, of course, the only correct answer is, yay. Um, and, and so this was a team I was in for several months, and the only reason this team existed was to fix the sort of bugs and regressions that had occurred as a result of this mammoth merging of two branches of code. Now, this scarred myself and many other people, and actually led to a lot of the changes in how we think, think about handling branches that led to uh, things like trunk-based development and continuous delivery, which I'll come on to shortly. Uh, many years later, by the way, I was woken up in my bed. The ground was shaking. I was living in London, so this wasn't a normal occurrence, uh, and found out that there'd been a huge explosion at an oil refinery. That oil refinery was right next to the headquarters of Dixon's where I used to work. As far as I'm aware, it hasn't been conclusively proven that this massive explosion was, was the cause of this merge of code, but it could have been. I'm not saying it's not happening, but anyway. Now, of course, the, the question I gave them when I tell this story is that people ask me, but, but, but weren't you doing continuous integration. You are ThoughtWorks, you're the company that popularized the whole concept of CI, and so why weren't you integrating your code to avoid this sort of huge, big, giant merge? And the reality was, we were. I'm just gonna reprise continuous integration very briefly, because I think it's a very important concept, but I'm not sure that we always have the same definition. Uh, but CI works in a very simple way. You know, I work on my, on my laptop, I, I create some code, I check that code into some kind of source control repository. Now, back then, we didn't have things like Git. We had much, more, much worse things. Uh, and then some kind of CI tool. So back then, we were making use of cruise control. Um, nowadays, you'd use Jenkins or GoCD or something like that. We'll pick up that change and we'll integrate it with the last commit. That's effectively what happens is you integrate the code. You then do a compile step and a verification step. Uh, and you get a feedback on whether or not your change works. So, you know, here I am, I'm checking in my code, that's great, next developer goes to check in their code, and they're making sure that their changes integrate with my changes. And it's not just enough to say, okay, I don't get a merge conflict, this should be that semantically, the software still behaves how we expect it to behave after we brought these two changes of code together. Um, so that's the first thing. You need some sort of suite of, of, of a build that will validate the integration. So, you know, compilation, static analysis, automated testing, together, these things work together, right? Now, if I check in a change and I break the build, what that means is the integration has failed. Hopefully, what I've actually done is run the test locally before I checked in, and so I've actually probably got a legitimate sort of, you know, misintegration problem happening. So the next thing you've got to say is, okay, if you have a breaking build, you've got to fix that build. It becomes the top 
um, job of the team is to make sure that build is fixed. And normally what you would do is if you checked in the breaking change, you would fix that breaking change and no one else would check in until that's done. This leads to some interesting behaviors where people will not check in at four o'clock on an afternoon on a Friday because if the bill breaks, they are not going to the pub. Uh, so that's a really key thing. But you also, you have this idea that you want to integrate often because if you take a long time until you go and finally check your change in, you might find that actually that you've been working for a while locally on your machine and you finally check that code in many days later, you're much likely to, you're likely to have that big merge problem again, right? So you want to avoid that. And so the other rule, the cardinal rule of, of CI is that you integrate daily, right? If you're doing continuous integration, you are integrating daily. That's, that's the goal. That's what the original paper in 2000 said. It's what Martin's updated article said. That's what continuous integration is. The reality was, though, on Dixon's, we were doing continuous integration. The problem was how we were doing it. So you had the R4, the R3 team and the R4 team, separate branches of code. And so as the R3 people were working on their changes, they had a CI build. And the R4 people also had a CI build. But that integration was a pure local integration. We were only actually looking at the changes within isolation of that team. And so when we pulled over all that functionality, we still had that same old problem. So clearly there's something a bit, bit different here. But nonetheless, that idea of constant integration was something we always talked about. The more frequently you integrate your changes, the easier it's going to be if you do with merges because by definition you should have a smaller scope of change and therefore it's much easier to carry out that merge activity. But this goal of integrating once a day butts up against another problem. Namely, not all of your work can be done in a single day's worth of work. Even if you thought, think it could be, something's going to happen, right? You're going to get called into a meeting or a volleyball game or something like that. You're sick, right? And so you can't integrate every, you can't necessarily finish a feature every single day because some features are also more complex than others. So if we want to integrate often to make it easy for us to handle merges, how do we do that when we've got work that's half finished? There's a bunch of different ways that we can handle this problem. Option one is actually just don't check it in. Now, we don't really like this anymore, but we used to do this a lot, right? I mean, we just wouldn't check it in for several days. Uh, and then if your machine broke and you, your hard drive got trashed, you lost several days' worth of work. And so we really don't like doing that anymore because it's kind of sucky. So we want to put our code somewhere safe in case something bad happens. So that's option number one. We'll put that off to one side. Option number two, let's make a branch. So here, what we're going to do, just like we did for R4, we took a branch of that code to allow us to work effectively on features that weren't quite ready to go into production because they hadn't been finished off. And then sort of that promotion activity of now saying, right, now that's the release branch allows us to release those features. You know? So here I am, I'm working on a new feature. Uh, that feature's gonna take me several days. So I create a branch of code and I make my changes locally on that branch. And my, my colleague does likewise. They take a branch as well. They work on their features. This allows us to, although our, our feature's not quite implemented yet, it's not quite fully there, I can safely check in and commit to that branch and then when I'm ready, I'll merge that back into trunk, which is where I'm going to release from. This might be called master, depending on your version control system. And so I've checked a big change in, and I've made that work, and that's integrated, and that's fantastic. And then my colleague does the same and find that I've made loads of changes earlier, and they get really annoyed because they've got a whole big merge activity. But this is sort of how feature branches work, right? You, you have those changes, and you make those changes safely on a separate branch, allowing you to make lots of commits until your feature is ready and then you merge that back in. And we can use CI tools to actually run builds on those branches as well, so we still get that feedback about things working, and we can integrate continuously if we want to our branch. Um, so it's very easy to set things like Go, which is my favorite CD tool up on these sorts of things. The issue though is we have the same problem that we did with the R3, R4 merge here, right? We are integrating continuously with our branch. We're not integrating continuously with everybody else's changes. We are still deferring integration into that deployable unit. And this sort of leads me into my, my sort of my general problem with all this approach. Okay, I mean, I, I, the pain of a merge, it's almost like it's, it's, there's going to be a function here somewhere. I'm hoping someone's going to do research in this. But it's like the pain of a merge is almost like a function of how big that merge is, what that delta is, and how long it's been since you last tried to integrate with that code. It's like the, it's not just the size, it's the duration. 
Because the duration also matters, because you've lost track of what the hell's going on on trunk. You don't know. It's hard to understand what changes have been made while, while, while you've been off in your own little bubble, working away off to one side. So, you know, that's not great. And, and we know that, like, uh, big merges also lead to the fun, fun act of commit races. You've seen this happen, right, haven't you, right? You've been working for a few days on a feature, and you know it's going to be a bit of a pain to merge in, but you think you've just about got it right. But your colleague has also got a big commit they want to make. So what do you do? You distract them. You send them pictures, you send them pictures of, of kittens. You go out for lunch and suggest, oh, just one more beer for you. And then you run back to the office and you check your code in before they can check their code in. Because then they have to deal with the merge. So that's, it's funny, but it's also annoying. There's another issue that, that comes up, though, is, is it, it, and another reason why I'm really hesitant about having branches for, for feature delivery. And that's because merging refactorings is very difficult. When you're just adding new code, integrating that's sort of fairly straightforward, it's fairly easy. But if you're actually refactoring your code, for example, you're trying to create brand new abstractions to remove code duplication, source control tools are aware of textual differences. They're not aware of semantic changes. They can't read into your intent behind a change you made four weeks ago and reapply that intent on the new code you're merging in. We don't have operational transforms inside our source control tools. And so what you start seeing is that when people are working on branches that are around for several days is they are discouraged effectively from performing refactoring because if they refactor on their branches, they actually make that merge activity quite difficult. And so, like, you're trying to do something nice, you're trying to make the code a nicer place, and all you've done is made your own job more difficult when you try and merge that feature in. And so when you see these very, very long-lived branches, you see that people don't tend to refactor much. And on code bases where you have lots of long-lived branches, again, you don't see a lot of refactoring going on because it's too dangerous an activity. Okay, so I'm not a big fan, clearly, of feature branches. Uh, so what was the other option we talked about at the time? Okay, well, okay, so I want to integrate often. I don't want branches. Uh, so what if I just checked in anyway? Uh, okay, well, well, how does that work? Because if the feature isn't finished, how can I just check my code in anyway? It doesn't really seem to make sense. But this is the idea behind what we now call trunk-based development, which is everybody integrates into trunk. So everybody's there, and we're all working away on the same branch. This will be master in Git, uh, or whatever it is. And we're all integrating in together. The idea is that we're integrating really often, right? We're getting our changes in. We're making lots and lots of small integration steps. We're getting fast feedback as when those integrations work. And we're also get breaking up that merge pain. I'm not having one giant merge activity at the end. I've got lots of incremental merges going along the way. But again, we still need to deal with the fact that we don't actually have an answer here to how about half-finished features. So to make trunk-based development work, where you integrate once a day to mainline into trunk, we have to have some other technique. And that technique normally comes down to using something like feature toggles. So feature toggles are a way of you hiding partially implemented features or functionality in the, in, in the, in the existing system. So this is a really simple example of how feature toggles might work. Let's consider a website. Okay? So I'm working on the brand new super awesome amazing super widget which will display lolcats in a nice carousel on the bottom of my e-commerce website. Uh, and, and it's not quite finished yet, because I haven't quite got the text formatting correctly, and I keep bringing in like dogs instead of cats. So I'm working it through, right? but it's cutting edge, and it's any day now, it's going to be great. Uh, so what I do is I just actually hide that widget. So that widget's not available on the website, or not available on the production site, but there's a configuration file that as a developer, you can go and change the value of that configuration file, saying super widget is on, and now that appears on my web page. So the code is checked in, it's all integrated, but it's not actually visible in the production environment, it's not visible to my customers, but I have the ability to turn it on to test it in situ if need be. Now, configuration files are one way of doing this, and then obviously that has to get mapped into a Boolean condition somewhere in your code. But other common ways of using this is something like a flag, a command line flag. So Google, who famously do trunk-based development, who don't use feature branches, they make use of flags to turn features off and on. Uh, and actually, if you want to get really fancy, you can even allow, you, you can even use your flag system to allow you to turn things off and on at runtime, maybe using some kind of centralized configuration management system so a lot of times people will use things like Zookeeper or Console 
to provide configuration to running instances. And so I've seen people use these systems to allow you to turn features off and on. Now that's quite easy, actually, when you think about something as simple as I am working on a brand new widget, where you know, that widget is a thing that wasn't there before, and I'm just turning it on. It's quite easy to see how you'd implement something like that. It's quite straightforward um, to, to make that work. But a lot of the time, of course, we're changing existing functionality. What happens if what I'm actually changing is I'm changing the, another widget, and actually it's going to behave differently in the future? How would I half implement that? Well, we'll get on to that. So let's talk about how that might work. Let's give you a good, great, great uh, an example of this. Um, actually, this is actually an example from Go. Early days of Go, Go used to be called Cruise. And when Go first started uh, off, um, it was sort of a single server-based node uh, with you have like a manager build farm. But as it grew, there was a realization that we wanted more than one machine running the server process so you didn't have a single point of failure, allowing it to meet larger scale. So you've got this existing system inside Go that was making use of hypersonic. So hypersonic is perfectly okay if what you want is like an in-memory database. And at this point, you know, Cruise was just really, uh, Go was just really storing small amounts of metadata. Um, but it was actually quite deeply integrated into the product. And so what we're going to be able to do is instead say, okay, we want to be able to send Go live and have it run off, your, off a proper database, one that would actually allow you to achieve larger scale, uh, you know, make it easier in terms of different failure modes. But actually implementing you know, the support for, say, using Postgres or MySQL, the, the team reckoned it would actually take them a, like a few, quite a few concentrated weeks of just of focused effort to make that change. But they still wanted to be able to ship new features. Because the problem was it was quite, it was, was using a lot of parts of the code bases. But there was this hard constraint that new versions of Cruise, and as I do now with Go, were available every two weeks. So you can go to the website and download a brand new version every two weeks. That was the goal. So actually practicing continuous delivery with a downloaded product was quite a difficult challenge. OK, so this change is going to take us many weeks. But we also want to keep shipping features. And we want to make our software available for download. And we want to check into mainline. And this thing is quite integrated. So how do we go about doing this? So the answer is that you create effectively a brand new implementation of the changed functionality. So in this existing example, we're coming up with a work in progress generic SQL persistence implementation. And so you can check in an early version of this. It can be integrated. You can be running tests against it. But you need the ability to sort of turn it on to see how it's working in terms of the whole system. So the next thing you need to do is you need to create an abstraction point in your code. So in this particular example, you come up with, say, a, a sort of a higher order persistence interface. And then have the ability to turn it off and on. Again, implement a toggle around this. So by default, my um, hypersonic persistence implementation is wired in. But I can change that configuration value and have it instead use the SQL persistence instance. So for many weeks when you were downloading Cruise, internally, although the average person using Cruise wouldn't notice, there was a flag deeply inside the sort of the you should not touch configuration file that would allow you to turn on this work in progress SQL implementation. Now, if you did, it wouldn't work because it wasn't finished. But the team itself were able to actually play with that, make sure it was working, configure it, and when they were happy, roll that change out. This actually also gave them the mechanisms to allow people to incrementally move over to this new way of handling their persistence system. Once that feature was bedded in and they were happy with it, you remove the old implementation. You could potentially, even if you wanted to, remove the abstraction point. So rather than sort of using feature branching, where you have a branch of code where your other implementation is, or your change in behavior is, Instead, you are coexisting both implementations in the same code base at the same time via an abstraction point. And this pattern is called branch by abstraction. So rather than branching source code, I'm branching in the same version of the code. Now, this causes people, but people don't like this all the time because this actually requires that you have to refactor your code to create an abstraction point. I, I, my, my view always that is if you don't feel confident in, in refactoring your code to create an abstraction point, you've got different problems. Uh, but nonetheless, this use of a branch by abstraction model allows you to be checking in a change on existing behavior without having branching. And then you can turn which abstraction on you're using using a feature toggling mechanism. Now, there are some things to be aware of with feature toggles, and there are a few pitfalls, and people get themselves tied up in knots every now and then. I've certainly seen some bad uses of these techniques. So there are some rules I want you to, be to bear in mind with feature toggles and things. The first thing is the flag 
however that's used in your system, your code base, have it used in as few places as possible. So for example, if I want to turn a widget off and on, I only maybe want a, say, Boolean in my templating language somewhere, my templating code, yeah, maybe one place, maybe two places in code is okay. I worked with one team, and they used every flag, which was used in about you know, 50 or 60 places across their code bases. It became a real nightmare, and it got really confusing. So you're like, one place, one place in your code base. And then, you know, when you don't need them anymore, remove them. That same team had over 200 flags that were different in QA versus production. And you had no understanding as to whether or not the software you were actually testing in QA was the same that was actually employed in production environment. So be very, very careful about how you use these flags. You don't want loads. You remove them once you're done. Use them in a small number of places, and you'll be OK. There are some nice side benefits. When you create these abstraction points that allow for toggling of behavior, you actually open up the possibility of implementing other deployment-related activities that can be really useful when deploying in a safe manner. You can use it for things like A-B testing, for example. I've got the ability in the same code base to coexist two different implementations of the same abstraction, the same piece of functionality. I've got an abstraction point where I can toggle between the two. It's not a stretch to think, oh, I could now use that to implement something like an A-B test. Based, you know, maybe randomly I give you a different implementation of that abstraction point or based on some characteristic of your customer basis. Maybe I even mark the, a certain customer group as being the beta test customers and they get to see the new implementation. You've created that abstraction point, you can now use it for other things. It can also be used uh, with a bit more work for something like canary releasing where we release a brand new version of our, of our functionality to a small subset of our users. and If it behaves correctly, we can ramp up the uh, number of people that see it. So it's a, it's a, these are different ways of sort of taking advantage of that abstraction point you've got. Uh, now, I am actually working on a book at the moment to sort of talk about this whole thing in terms of you know, everything that happens from finishing a line of coding on a laptop to shipping in production. It's not going to be ready till the end of the year. But if you want to know a lot more about trunk-based development, an old colleague of mine, Paul Hammond, has got a great, a great website called trunkbaseddevelopment.com where he's captured a whole lot of stuff around the patterns and the use cases of that. So do give that website a read if you want to know a bit more. Now, coming out of the wreckage, I say wreckage, Dixon's is really interesting was, you know, from a development point of view, it was often quite tough, but it was a really successful project for the, for the company, both the ThoughtWorks and the client, right? Everyone's quite happy with it. But nonetheless, we came out of that experiencing, experience realizing long-lived branches are really problematic, um, you know, realizing that actually finding alternative ways of, of working with software in terms of how we handle source control was really important. So that led to extending the ideas behind CI, became trunk-based development, and then led to, you know, continuous delivery. So it's no surprise uh, Dave Farley, who's one of the, along with Jess Humble, wrote uh, continuous delivery, was the main tech lead on the Dixon's project. And he learned so much from our experiences of that that he, they, they kind of pulled together these new ways of working in that CD book. So the continuous delivery book is actually, it was a lot older than I thought, it's actually 2011. Uh, and, and an awful lot has actually changed since then. Um, but so much of what was in the book still really does apply now to, to, to this day and age. You know, there's lots of ideas in the continuous delivery book which I think are really important. One of the main shifts was beyond talking about CI and using trunk-based development as opposed to feature branches, was this idea of moving towards treating every check-in as a release candidate. Like, you should be happy with every check-in going into production. The reason this became really important was, was, was that shift in thinking about release cadence and release frequency. I think a lot of the work that had been done up to this point, especially the work I was doing with enterprise organizations, was about making releases themselves more reliable, uh, improving code quality, but we weren't necessarily improving the cadence of, of software deployments. But when you started seeing what was happening in the dot-com startup, they were realizing the value of much more fast and frequent releases. I think this has still been articulated best in, in John Osborne's talk, Ops Metametrics. It's an, it's an old talk now, but the slide deck's still gold. So uh, John's now CTO at uh, Etsy. He was previously head of Ops at Etsy and before that release manager for Flickr. As he made this observation though, that when we release software infrequently, we have sort of a twofold problem. On the one hand, when we take a long time between releases, each release has a larger change. It's a larger delta. There's more changes, there's more lines of code that have changed between this release and a previous release. That means that risk is inherently, that release is inherently more risky. There's more chance of something going wrong. It also follows that any release remediation is probably going to be more complicated because there's much more stuff has changed. 
Normally, with you know, large um, changes in release uh, in between one release and another, it's often just safer just to roll back rather than trying to fix that thing in situ. The other thing, of course, is that if you're only releasing infrequently, your release process isn't used that often. Therefore, it's more likely it's going to have problems with it. And also, you're not learning. You don't know if it, the customer likes these features or not, right? And then you get into these weird, nasty anti-patterns. You don't release that often. When you do release, you have a problem. You have a problem because the size of the release is so large, you've increased the risk of that release, and she had issues. And then people get cross and say, well, how, how do we make sure that we don't have a problem on our next deployment? I know we'll be extra specially careful in the next one. So we'll take more time, and we'll apply more rigor, and we'll put more processes in place. And so the next release will be even longer from now. And when we do that, oh, we've got a problem. What should we do? Let's take be even more careful about the next release and so your release cadences increase. It's amazing that how much of the work I've done around continuous delivery with clients has actually just been looking at release processes and realizing that a large amount of the procedures that are in place inside that organization kind of amount to organizational scar tissue. Like something really bad happened to us 10 years ago, and we put something in place to stop that problem from happening again. But no one actually remembers what that problem was. We just know we've got this nasty sort of scar on our body somewhere, right? And that's all what it is. So John made the observation that actually, if you shrink your batch size down, if you shrink down the size of each release, you have a smaller delta between each release. That means the, the risk of each release is much smaller. You're much less likely going to have a problem with that. And if you do, it's going to be easier to diagnose and fix it. You also release software more often, therefore your release process is more likely to work because you do it a lot. And you also get to learn from that. And so all of these ideas came together, and so the continuous delivery book was saying, well, how can we take that rigor of ensuring quality of our software, integrating our software more frequently, but also actually ship software to our customers more frequently? And it actually comes back to these core ideas. Integrate often, so you make sure all your code works together. When you defer integration, integration is more expensive, less likely to work. Keep the size of your changes small. And again, if you're integrating often, each integration is going to be small. And, and ship your software frequently. While, the con while Jez and Dave were working on the continuous delivery book, um, there was the little source control engine that could, Git, was, was, was buzzing about. Now, Git was, is, is covered in detail in the book, but really it wasn't making much impact in the world of software development as a whole. Uh, even in 2011, the, 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 the number of people that were using it in corporate sectors was, was quite small. It was very big in the open source sector. Uh, we should actually remember where Git came from. Git was designed as a replacement for BitKeeper, which was being used at that point to manage the Linux kernel. There was a falling out around licensing. I won't go into it. You can read it on Wikipedia. Uh, so Linus was stuck with a problem that he needed a source, an alternative source control system. Uh, and it's, it's probably important to reflect on why Git works the way it does. And it does to enable people to maintain the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel is quite different to most of the software that we work on. Most of our software, we integrate down to a single deployment um, that isn't, you know, and then we deploy it into one location for most of us. Most of us work on some kind of centrally deployed system that's used by multiple customers. The Linux kernel is not one thing. There's not one version of even the 3.6 kernel, right? It's made up of a whole number of different patches. Different operating systems will apply different OS, pa uh, different patches into their kernel. You know, the, the Red Hat kernel is different from the Ubuntu kernel and everything else. It's a, this, it's a different, it's kind of a mix and match metaphor. But nonetheless, no, Linus had this, I, this, this, this driver to make it very fast to integrate patches that were being sent to him. Most con version control systems at the time, he reckoned it would take him around 30 seconds to integrate a patch. His goal was being able to, to, to apply a patch in three seconds or less. Now, that doesn't mean understanding the patch and reading it and reasoning about it, but just the actual process of integrating that in. And so, you know, borrowing from previous distributed version control systems like BitKeeper and Arch and the others, uh, we have Git, and Git now has a few characteristics that kind of maybe shift the game a little bit when we start thinking about feature branching. One of the very first things to realize is that the branches inside Git are significantly more lightweight than the traditional version control tools that came before. In Subversion, for example, branching was a major activity because creating a branch normally involved in a whole copy of that source actually on the server. That could be a significant impact, and therefore you wouldn't just create branches willy-nilly, you'd have to have a conversation about it. 
What that meant was that when you did branch, you'd probably want to leave those branches lying around for a while, and not often you'd be encouraged to use that branch for multiple purposes. So that the R3, R4 example, Dixon's, was due in part to the cost of branching. So I thought it was easy to have one branch and lots, lots and lots of branches. There's other nice things, like you get a full copy of the source code history running on your laptop, and that's kind of nice and cool. So you can kind of commit locally and then push from your local source code as well. And also, the merging of the text in GitHub Git was significantly better than Subversion. It seems to do a better job of identifying changes in, in text and working, picking up things like renames and stuff like that. And I mean, to be fair, Subversion and things have got better as well. The key thing to understand, though, is that branches are more lightweight in Git, and the, the, the textual merging has been better than some of the systems before, but it's still not actually a semantic merge. People are, believe it or not, working on this. Uh, there are people out there now that are trying to look at language-aware merge tools and source control systems. Right. And, 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 and I think, I'm hoping, at some point in the future, we will have version control tools that actually operate you know, the equivalent of operational transforms in the code. You know, rather than when I do a rename of something, just storing the after effects in a text file, it actually version controls the rename operation. I mean, that's the only real answer, I think, to actually probably doing merges, but most of us don't have access to those tools, and I think a lot of them are pipe dreams at the moment. So Git was rumbling around at this time, but hadn't really kicked into high gear, primarily because people weren't using it that much, or other than on things like the kernel. But then there was GitHub. And GitHub is probably, I wouldn't say single-handedly, but certainly is a major part of why Git became popular. Um, 2008 is when Git was launched, GitHub was launched, and uh, it took them a while, but they, they, you know, their third blog post talked about rolling out the support for things called feature request, uh, pull requests. So pull requests are actually in the earliest version of, of Git. They're, I think the request, the, the Git pull request is actually a request pull operation. I can't quite remember the, the Git module. It was there from the very early days. Uh, but the GitHub developers thought they could do better and implemented a web front end. And the idea is that if you wanted to make a change to a piece of code, what you would do is you would fork the code you wanted to make a change to, you would make that change within that branch, that fork of the code, and then you would tell the maintainers, oh look, I've got a new version, I've made some changes to functionality, can you take a look at it and merge that change in? And this proved to fundamentally shift the way the open source software is developed. So uh, there's a number of people out there that have done some nice work visualizing uh, source control uh, changes for big projects over time. It's quite a nice thing. When you go back looking at big projects, look at the source control history, you can see all kinds of amazing things happening. Uh, one of the visualizations I found recently, which actually an old colleague of mine, Joe Walls, pointed me at this, actually shows the, um, the sort of development being done on Ruby on Rails. And a really interesting thing happens when you watch that video. At the point where the Ruby on Rails code base moved over to GitHub, you see something quite interesting. So, like many other open source tools, sort of Ruby on Rails works about, you know, have a core set of committers that have rights to push into mainline. But they also take commits and um, changes from around the wider community. Now, that process was sort of slightly, always slightly tortuous when we had things like, you know, non, uh, in the world before change requests, uh, sorry, pull requests. What the Ruby on Rails people found out about here is when they moved over to GitHub, the pull request mechanism drastically lowered the barrier to entry for sort of untrusted committers, as in people who weren't part of the core team to get involved. And you see this explosion in growth in the number of committers involved actively on the Ruby on Rails project. And that, that sort of, that little twist of making it very easy for you to work on your changes safely and then tell people about them and have those maintainers look at and apply those changes in a fairly safe manner really shifted things along. So sort of no surprise in a way that it was only, it was, you know, it was very shortly after they launched. I mean, you imagine the meteoric growth of GitHub, that sort of three years after launching, they were already more successful, more pop handling more commits than both Google Code, which has now been closed down, and SourceForge together. SourceForge, of course, being the big dad at the time, and now is a great place if you want to go and download malware. But apparently that's been fixed. But of course, Sam, you were talking about feature branching and how bad feature branching was earlier. And basically, pull requests are a field form of feature branching, right? You are creating a fork of the code, you are working on that change, and then you are asking it to be pulled back in. The difference is here, I think pull requests work very well when you've got people outside of a core team who are committing less sporadically, who are maybe not part of that core trusted team. 
you have the ability to make it easy for them to commit, but you have the ability also to vet that change and integrate that change. I think it is a subtly different thing. I don't really like, I, when I see people working inside a small co-located team, making use of pull requests internally, you know, I always have to question, what's the point? What's the, what's the value in that ceremony? But for untrusted committers, which is ultimately what the vast majority of open source contributions represent, I think the pull request mechanism works very well. And although, yes, there are some potential downsides to those branches, you can't have those untrusted committers committing really, really frequently because they are some value of untrusted committers. So that got really successful, and GitHub has really been an incredibly empowering uh, uh, sort of representation of how open source code can work and actually how sort of untrusted committers can work. And that's led to similar changes being provided in lots of other source control systems. And Linus is still angry about how they implemented uh, pull requests, but you know, they won, so he should shut up. Uh, and then, of course, there was Gitflow, because if there's something worth doing, there's something worth doing really complicatedly. Um, <laughs> so, this is an overview of how Gitflow works. Now, Git really lowered the, the, the cost of creating branches, and it made it much cheaper and quicker and faster and more efficient to create branches. And so people started using this to implement different variations on the feature branching mechanism. This is just one overview of how feature branching can work. So we have master, and then we have the hotfix branches, and then we have the release branches, and then we have the development branches, and then you have the feature branches. Uh, I don't understand all this because I'm old and quite stupid. Um, and actually, there are some people that really like this model and, and have created tools on top of the Git flow mechanism of how you work. Uh, but this is a formalized mechanism for doing feature branches. And sort of the Git flow um, high level scripts on top can really help you try and sort of make sense of all this. But I really have trouble conceptualizing this workflow in my head. And actually, when I, when I sort of manage to peer through the fog, it seems to me that things like Gitflow are actually optimizing for a model where a developer is sitting by themselves working on feature for a long period of time. And fundamentally, it doesn't sit right with me, this idea that you have a developer who works on a feature by themselves for a long period of time. The creation of software is a social activity. It's a, it's a collective activity. I like the idea that you've got an important feature that lots of people have worked on that and understand how it works. Again, in an open source world, where by definition, because of geography, because of availability of people, this is always going to happen. But on the team structure, you think something like Gitflow feels weird to me because it's, it's just promoting and enabling working off by yourself on a branch for a long period of time. That doesn't help me ship software frequently and integrate often. And I get some people saying, oh, no, but we use Gitflow, but we always merge back in really, really fast. And, and, and so we integrate really, really frequently, so Gitflow's fine. And I go, okay, so if you're integrating back into mainline like every day, why the hell do you need Gitflow? It doesn't seem to make sense to me. I'm still not entirely sure of, of the sweet spot for Gitflow. It seems overly complicated for most people to get their head around when contributing to open source projects. And for co-located teams, there seem to be better ways of working. I'm happy to be proven wrong, but every single picture I show explaining to me how Gitflow works just made me want to kill myself. Other things have moved on, though, as well. We now have organizations that are actively uh, providing solutions to make feature toggling more easy. So uh, Split.io and LaunchDarkly are, are two of the best examples of that. Um, now, I've poked around a bit with, with Split.io, and they've got some really interesting features. The way it works is you can actually go and configure your flags, and your application can reach out and grab the values of these flags from a central system, and so you've got a place where you can store different configuration sets and even update those things at runtime. And so both of these tools come with an SDK that you integrate into your application. Uh, now, I have some real reservations about offloading my feature flagging to sort of effectively a SaaS-based product like this, because ultimately, this thing has to be up for my system to work, and that's, that coupling really does worry me. Uh, I mean, the Split IO team certainly have done some stuff around mitigating those features, but I'm still, you know, I'm not sure. But on the other hand, they make it very, very easy for you to integrate toggles and actually build really interesting things on top of it. They make it very easy, for example, to segment flags by customer. So if you want to enable a beta set of customers, you can very easily say, OK, that customer is a beta customer. Therefore, they see the beta set of features and providing those high level management. They even do geo location aware features. So you can roll out certain features to certain parts of the world based on IP address, which is kind of cool. I'm hoping also some of you have read this book. This is the DevOps handbook written by sort of four of the devops -y pioneers people, you know, Gene Kim, Jez Humble, uh, John Willis, and Patrick Dubois, who of course came up with the term um, uh, uh, DevOps in the first place. And in this book, they do revisit the topic of trunk-based development in, the you know, in 2000 and 
well, 16 when they wrote the book, so 2017, looking again at the concept of trunk-based development. And unsurprisingly, they have opinions because Jez, who wrote, continuously wrote this book as well. So here's what they say about uh, trunk-based development. The first statement I think most of us can agree is quite true. Trunk-based development is likely the most controversial practice discussed in this book. I've had more religious debates about trunk-based development and feature development than anything else in my career. Um, but they go on to say, uh, however, the data from the Puppet Lab's 2015 State of DevOps report is clear. Trunk-based development predicts higher throughput and better stability and even higher job satisfaction and lower rates of burnout. Now, there was a, did anyone here come to Nicole's talk earlier today? Hands up if anyone of you did. All right, so some of you may know what I'm going to say. So the, the okay, data, the Puppet Lab state of DevOps. I don't use Puppet, I use Chef. What's this got to do with me? Um, in a way, this, this, sort of, this ongoing survey that they've been doing now for several years uh, it, it's almost maybe misnamed because I think it's now covering topics so broad that just calling it DevOps in a way might, might underplay its significance. But this, this study has been looking at the efficacy of certain uh, practices and culture and behavior. So what they've been doing is identifying the practices and behaviors of high-performing IT teams and trying to work out what practices are sort of statistically significant in terms of working out correlation and things like that. So they look at do these behaviors, are these, so are these ways of developing software things that lead to good, high-performing high IT teams or, or not high-performing IT teams? Um, the latest version of, of the reports available is a 2016 report. It's definitely worth a read. It's quite terse. Um, and the new version will be available in six weeks. The 2016 version, um, uh, looking at their analysis, uh, says this. We have found that having branches or forks with very short lifetimes, less than a day, before being merged into trunk, and less than three active branches in total are important aspects of continuous delivery and all contribute to higher performance. So does merging code into trunk or master on a daily basis. So this means that they found a statistically significant correlation between practicing tr trunk-based development and high-performing IT teams. That's not to say that you can't be a high-performing IT team and use feature branching, just that that's not what they found in general to be the case. And so we're now starting to get some sort of fairly rigorous research that's implying what some of us have believed based on our own experiences um, and started to see that these things might apply. Now, I don't mean to validate your own experiences. You may well have an organization that's using the feature branches and it's working extremely well, in which case that's great. What we are starting to see now is that research in general shows that you may well be better off practicing a different form of development. So summarizing this off, I'm not necessarily here to say that branches are inherently evil. They're probably less evil than they were in the past. If anyone's here has tried doing branch management in CVS or PVCS or MKS source integrity or Star Teams versions or Star Teams dimensions or uh, SCCS, SCCS, oh, that was a good one. I've used all of those systems. I've used about three of the different Microsoft version control tools as well. And a lot of those experiences were generally quite miserable. And some of them regarding branches were absolutely awful. The only one I never got to work with was ClearCase. Uh, because I made sure that I would, whenever there was a project coming up where I'd be using ClearCase, I would be sick that day. Uh, so branches have got a lot easier to work with, and Git has shown us how lightweight they can be just by doing some smart engineering. And so some of the traditional challenges around them have been reduced. But ultimately, it all still comes back to that same problem, is that if you're using branches to avoid integration, you're probably not actually going to be optimizing for frequent delivery of software. You're not optimizing for integration early, making sure your software actually works. So by all means, use feature branches for things like experimental code. Use feature branches for, so it's use branches for things like release branching, you know, where you have a unidirectional merge. But using them for feature branching, I'm still remain unconvinced 14 years on is a good idea. I keep coming back to the same sort of tenants that are repeated again and again in the continuous delivery book and, and earlier in, in the work around uh, continuous integration. Integrate often, keep your batch sizes small, and ship your software frequently. Right. If you want to ship software quickly, find out if your software works, and according to the state of DevOps report, potentially even reduce team burnout, practicing some form of trunk-based development is probably still the right answer, even after all the changes and shifts that we've had in technology. Now, I am sure there are questions and abuse. That's fine. I'm a grown-up. Um, so are there any questions out there? 
We have a question in the middle. Have we got time for questions, Bridget? And I'm, and I'm positive that you have questions and people have questions and are going to want to ask them. And unfortunately, we are completely out of time oh. for the session. But that means you can do the traditional rush, rush the stage and come and chat with yes. him. Yes. Let him pack his laptop up first. Yes. So I'll, I'll come and answer a question down here. Uh, if not, you can hurl abuse at Sam Newman on the Twitters. Uh, but thank you very much for your time. Thank you.